Yes, you can question everything. Everything? Everything. Everything. Yeah, everything. Split it. What answers are you looking for? Why are we here? What happens if we die? I want to know what's out there. Is there a God? Do you believe in the devil? I believe in science. This can't be true. See, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. What? I'm afraid to ask. I'm afraid to ask. You must be brave. You're not like the soul knocks it. Oh, really? Are there any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Well, I am excited about today because uh, in July, we always, the first Sunday, we have our campus closed in order to give our volunteers and our staff a little bit of break right before we completely gear up to head into the fall. So this is an online only experience. And for the online only experience, we thought we'd take a few of the questions that we didn't have a chance to get to in some of the other weeks of our Any Question series and just kind of jump into them. So that's what we're gonna do today. This will be a little bit shorter than the in-person experience. And hopefully we'll get through a few of these and they will be interesting. Uh, quickly, I am answering these questions from the perspective of a Christian, something I've named every week, but if you're a skeptic or you're not sure about faith, maybe this will help you to understand how a Christian might answer some of this. So we're going to jump into a question I got in several different forms. It was kind of interesting, but here it is. Uh, how do dinosaurs fit in the Bible? How do dinosaurs fit in the Bible? You know, a very simple answer for this question, which is that um, they don't. Uh, dinosaurs don't really fit in the Bible. There's not really any dinosaurs in the Bible that we can tell. Now, there are a couple of creatures mentioned in the book of Job and in some other places in the Hebrew Bible called Leviathan and Behemoth that kind of sound like dinosaurs. And so sometimes people will try to use that as evidence that dinosaurs existed in the Bible. I'm gonna read you a couple of passages where these uh, creatures are mentioned. So here's one from Job chapter 41. We read this. Can you catch, this is the Lord speaking by the way to Job. He says, can you catch Leviathan with a hook or put a noose around its jaw? Can you tie it with a rope through the nose or pierce its jaw with a spike? Will it beg you for mercy or implore you for pity. Uh, chapter before that, we read about Behemoth, and it says this, take a look at Behemoth, which I made, just as I made you. It eats grass like an ox. See its powerful loins and the muscles of its belly. Its tail is as strong as a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are knit tightly together. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs are bars of iron. So reality is uh, most scholars believe that the Leviathan and the Behemoth were two Jewish mythical creatures, not real animals that you would find out and about, but that they're referenced to kind of uh, metaphorically display God's amazing power here in these Old Testament passages. There are some other scholars who believe that perhaps they were something like a crocodile or a hippopotamus, but what they almost certainly are not are dinosaurs, and I think the mythical creature is uh, probably the, the best uh, explanation. We have, by the way, mythical creatures today. You're probably fairly familiar with them. Like, these are creatures that do not exist, but if you mention them, everybody knows what you're talking about. So for instance, we have you know, a, a unicorn, and you say unicorn, everybody knows what it is. Or we have a, uh, a dragon, right? Dragons, these are, these are not real creatures, but if you say it, like people know what you're talking about. Or we have Chuck Norris, you know, not a real creature that you would find out in the wild, but a mythical animal that people would kind of know what you're talking about. So what we need to understand about dinosaurs is that they existed long before the Bible was written. Frankly, they existed long before there were people. Dinosaurs went extinct about 66 million years ago. Human beings have been around for probably 250 to 300,000 years. We've only had civilization for the last 10 to 12,000 years. And we didn't even know dinosaurs ever existed until probably around, and this was a very small minority people, probably around the 17th century. The first paper I could find that was written about dinosaurs was written on one bone that was found. Uh, back in the 17th century, and they weren't given the name dinosaurs until the 19th century, in the 1840s, about when we had that. Which means George Washington, who died in 1799, didn't even know that dinosaurs existed. So how do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? Well, the answer is that they don't. It's very unlikely that biblical writers would have known anything about dinosaurs. They were long dead by the time they were alive, and archaeology hadn't gotten to a place where they were finding dinosaur bones and these ancient, gigantic reptiles. So, so they don't seem to be mentioned in the scripture at all. It's an interesting question, though. Here's another one that you asked. Um, are all other religions wrong, or do all religions just use different language to point to the same reality. So this is one of the questions you guys are. All the religions, uh, aside from Christianity, assuming is, is the way this is being asked, wrong, or do all religions just use different language to point to the same reality? So there, there are two 
kinds of major schools of thought that you'll hear said about this. The first is that all religions are equally right, and the second one is that all religions are equally wrong. And I want to, uh, just for a few moments, kind of push back on both of those for just a moment. So here's the first one, that, that all religions are equally right. There are some people that believe this. And so if they were to map out what world religions teach, it's something like this, that you know, whether it's Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism, whatever the world religion it is, uh, it's, all, it's using different language to talk about ultimate reality, but that it is all pointing in the same direction. And while people have written about different ways of experiencing this ultimate reality, it's all pushing forward and pointing to the same thing. That's, that's one belief, that all religions are equally right. They are all pointing to ultimate reality. The challenge with this is, if you actually read through what different religions teach, their teachings are very much at odds with one another. They don't agree about like, what we're being saved for or from. Uh, they don't agree about the right way or proper way forward from that. Uh, they don't agree about how one should live or how one should think about one's sense of life or purpose or the reason that the universe was started or the way the universe will or will not end. They don't agree about anything, hardly. And so it's very hard to say that all religions are just using different language to point to the same thing because they aren't compatible belief systems. What we actually see is something quite different from that. We see that all religions start at the same place. All religions start at the belief that something is wrong. Something's not quite right. And they may define that a little bit differently, but then they're all taking different branches to determine what it is that's wrong and how it is that we are supposed to fix it. So all religions can't be equally right, but I do think that they oftentimes start with the same sense of things, which is that the world doesn't seem like it's the best possible version of itself it could be. Now, Jesus talked about uh, the way to God. And if Jesus is correct, then the way that our world has been conceived was out of great love, an all-loving, creative God created us to join into the triune, loving relationship he had for all eternity between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we were created then to jump into the middle of that union, the middle of that dance, and to become a part of it. Uh, he didn't need us to, you know, to, to not be lonely because he, is a, he exists as a plurality of, of, of a community. But he's invited us into it, which is a pretty beautiful thing. And then Jesus says specifically that the, the best way into that, the only way into that is through him. So Jesus in John 14 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through me. If you'd really known me, you would know who my father is. And from now on, you do know him and you have seen him. Now, in week one of this series, we answer the question like, well, does everyone who ends up finding their way to God through what Jesus did, through his teachings, his life, his death, and his resurrection, are they all aware that they are finding their way to God because of that? In week one, we said like, we're not sure. Uh, there's good evidence uh, kind of on both sides of that. Take a look at week one of this series if you want to know more about this. That was questions we answered about what happens after you die. Uh, but, this, but Jesus certainly says he's the way forward. So this is either true or it's not true. And as followers of Jesus, we believe that this is true. And so any religious tradition then that would go against this, we would say is not true. You know, it, it may have truth within it, like different religious traditions will oftentimes bring out things that are just true about the world or about the way that we interact with each other. There's a lot of wisdom contained within so many of these traditions. But on points like this, where there's not a possibility for compatibility, where it's, it's definitely like they're, they're talking you know, it, it, from different sides of a continuum, then we would say that the truth claims of Jesus are what we would cling to and that we think that those things are true. Now, that may seem really arrogant, but I just wanna tell you that every religious tradition has exclusive claims, including atheism and even versions of agnosticism. And I wanna like, prove that by pointing to this next thing, which is that we, we move from all religions being equally right to the other belief that maybe all religions, religions are just equally wrong. And the way that this is often portrayed, uh, kind of an illustration of this, is with this uh, elephant and blind men set up. So uh, this, this, I think this is one of the better uh, diagrams of this I've found over the years, but it just says our own experience is rarely the whole truth. So the idea is that you have some blind men who are, you know, are blindfolded or they can't see anything, and so they, they go to an elephant and they start to you know, touch the elephant, different parts of the elephant, 
And the one who touches its, you know, its trunk says, oh, it's a snake, right? It feels like a snake to him. The one who touches the side of the elephant says, no, uh, it's a wall. Or the one who touches maybe his leg, you put your leg around, he's like, no, 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 it's, it's a pillar. Uh, or the one who's um, grabbing his tail says, no, no, it, it's a rope. And the idea is that these are all people trying to speak to the same reality, but they think, right, it's a snake, it's a wall, it's a rope, but they're all wrong, that there's a greater reality that they're not capable of seeing because of their blindness. And so kind of the way that this is oftentimes used to talk about religious traditions is to say that, well, uh, we're all kind of blind to, in our own religious tradition and we can see a part of the whole that we're wrong. There's a bigger part to that. So Christians then would seem like they are being exclusive and unhelpful by saying they're the ones who believe the true thing because if they could really see reality, they would notice they only have a part of the whole. But do you see that this is just as arrogant as a Christian saying that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. The person who says that this is the portrayal of ultimate reality is also say, saying that they understand what ultimate reality is. Christians get it wrong, Jews get it wrong, Muslims get it wrong, Hindus get it wrong, but, but we get it right. We're the ones who know that actually reality looks like this. And you could say the same thing if you said, all religions are totally wrong and there is no ultimate reality except the like, Big Bang and evolution and that's it. There's you know, a godless universe. All of those are exclusive teachings, exclusive beliefs. They all think they are correct at the expense of other traditions. They may say that other traditions have something that you can learn from them, that there's good and beautiful things about them, but they're all making exclusive claims that are not compatible with other religious traditions. So when you ask the question like, are all other religions besides Christianity wrong, as a follower of Jesus, as someone who has been convinced that he actually lived and died and rose from the dead, then yes, I believe that there are points at which those other religious traditions are wrong. Anywhere where they conflict, with the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of Christianity, I think that they're wrong. But if that sounds really arrogant, please know that everyone who has any belief around this at all holds that belief somewhat arrogantly. You would have a different opinion if you thought you were wrong, but you think you're right. So you believe that other people are wrong. That's just how this works. So uh, that's a little bit on that question. Hopefully that's a little bit helpful. And I wanna take one more that I thought was really interesting that you guys sent in. So here it is. We're Adam and Eve, real people. We're Adam and Eve, real people. So uh, if you're unaware, the, the Bible starts off with a story. Genesis 1, 2, and 3, there's a creation account in Genesis 1. Then there's kind of a continuation of that creation account in Genesis chapter 2. And in Genesis chapter 2, we're introduced to Adam and Eve. Uh, the Hebrew, it's Hadam and, and Eve. And uh, just a little bit about that. If you want to like really dig into this particular topic, Here's a great book that I would recommend for you. It's called Four Views on the Historical Adam. There's some great contributors, but there, there's different ways of, of seeing this particular issue. I wanna share with you today um, the view that I find most compelling because I don't have time to go through all of them, but then I would, I would certainly welcome you to check this out because you may find something else compelling. And uh, I think that all of the contributors to this volume are faithful Christians who you know, put their faith in Christ and they're trying to work through what's a, a challenging uh, theological question. So we're Adam and Eve, uh, real people. I want to first of all just talk through what we know about the story a little bit that's different. Now, we're going to do a whole series about Genesis 1 through 11 in the fall, and uh, we're calling it the lost world of the Bible origins. Just what, those first 11 chapters of Genesis, what all is happening there, and there's a ton. So, to give you a little sneak peek of that today, some of this will be repeated, I'm sure, in the fall as we look at it, but around the Adam and Eve story, because there's some fascinating stuff happening in this story that we, we are only aware of now because we have access to lots more ancient Near Eastern writings from that time. We understand the Hebrew better. We understand the culture better than we once did. And so a lot of this was new to me just a few years ago, and hopefully you'll find some of it interesting as well, and we'll talk about much more of this in the fall. So here's just a few things about this passage. First of all, Hadam is used in Genesis 1 through 5 in a variety of ways. So just, just to name what those ways are, 22 times it's used with the definite article. In other words, when it refers to Adam in the original Hebrew, it calls him the Adam. Now you don't use the definite article in front of a name in Hebrew. That's not a normal thing you do. So when it's using it with the definite article, it seems that what's happening there is it's using Adam as a stand-in for all of humanity. In fact, the word, hatam, it means dirt, or it means human, humanity, like all of humanity. There's different ways to understand it. But just a, a few things that I find interesting about that. First of all, uh, the, the 
Genesis chapter two talks about the way that God created human beings. And he took the dirt of the earth and he breathed into it the breath of life. Why did these ancient Israelite people believe that human beings are made out of dirt? Well, much of what, the, what we see in Genesis is them just looking around and observing what actually happens in their world and then giving some explanatory power to it. Uh, it when someone dies, Eventually, their flesh will rot away. I know this is a beautiful thought to have uh, this early in the day. Their flesh will rot away, and uh, their bones eventually will decompose, and they will turn to dust. So in a certain way, we are definitely made out of dust. In fact, scientists now know that we're made out of stardust, specifically, that the same kinds of like uh, dust, chemicals, particles that we see in space that come out of dead stars are actually found within us as well. But these early ancient writers knew nothing of that. All they knew was that when someone dies, they turn back into dust. So from dust you came, from dust you will return. They were just talking about the way the world works. So Adam literally just means dust, or it's a stand-in for all of humankind, all of humanity. So when we read this story about Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden and them rebelling against God, there's a way in which it's meant to be, Adam is meant to be a stand-in for all of us. That what he does when he rebels against God is what all of us do in our hearts, in our rebellion against God at some point. So it's used with the definite article 22 times when it's the Adam, which means it's a stand-in for all of us. Three times it's used with an attached preposition, and then nine times it's used with no definite article or preposition. So it seems that sometimes Adam is used as a stand-in for all of us, and sometimes he's referred to more as an actual figure who lived and who was really alive and was really in a garden of Eden. So that's, that's a little bit about uh, Adam. Uh, number two, forming from dust and building from rib are archetypal claims uh, archetypal claims and not claims of material origins. Okay, so let me just unpack these for just a moment. Something being formed from the dust, right? God breathing into it, the breath of life. And then we're told also that uh, Eve was taken, if you look in the English translations, it'll say that, that uh, a rib was taken from Adam's side and that Eve was, Eve was created out of the rib. Now, when I was growing up in a Southern Baptist church in East Texas, the joke was that, yeah, uh, Eve came from the rib of Adam, which by the way, is the cheapest cut of meat. Ha, 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 ha. Well, that's actually not what that passage says. So let's just take a look at uh, the Genesis 2, uh, verse number seven. So we, we read this, the Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground, he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. So uh, basically what this is saying is we are, we are made of dust, and that the only way that those bones can live, that this dust can come to life, is for God to breathe into it. That life then originates from God, which I believe is true, that life originates from God. And then we, we read on. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while the man slept... The Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. And then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. So some of what's happening here in the Hebrew doesn't do well in the English translation. And it's kind of fascinating stuff. So this word that we translate ribs is the word, Hebrew word uh, selah. And that word is not translated as rib anywhere else in the Hebrew Bible. What it actually is is side that God like took the side of a man. It's like he split Adam in half. If you wanna read more about this disturbing image, you can look at John Walton's book, The Lost World of Adam and Eve. But God essentially, it's like, it's like Adam was split in two and then out of the same substance that Adam was, woman came from that. In other words, this is Adam understanding that there are lots of creatures in this world, lots of animals in this world, but this woman is not like the other animals. This woman is like him. And so they're compatible for one another. They should work together with one another. Uh, then the, the word sleep here is uh, tar tardima. And the Hebrew word tardima, and look, I, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. These are not my native languages. So if, uh, if you know a lot of Hebrew and I'm pronouncing this a little wrong, uh, it, apologies. But the, the Hebrew word tardima, to fall into a deep sleep, um, it's the kind of sleep that doesn't just happen like when you, we think of anesthesiology, right? He was like, he went under, an, an anesthesiologist put him under, and then God took a rib out, and he didn't hurt because he was asleep, and then out of the rib, he formed Eve. That's how I thought of this passage forever. But what it's actually saying is that God put Adam into a deep kind of sleep. It's the same word that's used when Abraham is put to sleep by God later on in the book of Genesis, and he has a vision of God walking through these animal pieces to create a covenant with him. This Hebrew word is often used when people have visions. And so what seems to be happening in this passage 
is that God is putting Adam, who is a stand-in for all of mankind, right? He's putting Adam to sleep. And then out of Adam, he's splitting him in two and saying like, this woman is not like the other creatures. She's like you. And this is the vision he has. So while he's in this sleep, he understands who Eve is then when he finally meets her when, when they wake up. And so there's just a lot going on here, but it's showing that these are um, archetypal claims that Adam and Eve are stand-ins, not just for actual historical people, but for all of us, all of men and women, and our understanding of our relationship with God. That's how these things are being used over and over and over again. Uh, number three, Adam then is assigned as priest in sacred space with Eve to help. What we often see happening in these ancient Near Eastern creation accounts is that there is a temple that's built, and then there are priests who are assigned in the temple to, to uh, keep the space sacred and holy for whatever God they're supposed to be worshiping. The, the way, there's so many different ways that this Genesis account differs from those accounts, and it's really beautiful. But one of the ways that it's similar is that the Garden of Eden then basically has Adam and Eve as its priests. This is, this is a space on earth where heaven and earth seem to touch, where God walk, walks in the cool of the day, where he has uh, fellowship and a relationship with his people. Which leads to the question, like, is, is there, are there any people who exist outside of this garden? And there's nothing in this text that would suggest that there aren't. In fact, later on, just a, a few chapters later, uh, you'll see that uh, Cain and Abel, uh, Cain ends up killing Abel, and then Cain ends up going and finding a wife for himself, and then Cain finds a, a, a city and establishes a city. There seem to be other people. So what all is happening here? Is this Garden's supposed to be like the starting place for you know, all of the earth to be consumed by it eventually, where priests are taking over. Like, are there other people outside of this who are living like hard lives? And we're not given an answer for that. Like, the, the Bible is, seems intentionally very murky about this stuff. Uh, but, but Adam and Eve are assigned as priests of sacred space uh, in this particular passage. And what it's doing is it's showing how in the beginning, God was looking to bring order to the world. And what it's pointing to then, as we see like, like the New Testament writers looking back on this, is that Jesus is the plan to resolve non-order, order, and disorder. So let me talk about the difference between those three things, and then we'll be done for today. Non-order is simply this. It's chaos that no one has brought order to. Disorder is something that used to be ordered, but at some point, someone made it chaotic. And then order is what the Garden of Eden is all about. It is what the peace and shalom of God is all about. That life is good, that things are going well when there is order in it. And so God has this garden, and he brings order to it. And there's plants, and there's, and there's wildlife, and there's, you know, there's priests essentially to oversee this garden, Adam and Eve, and they name the animals, and they take care of this sacred space. But then they sin, they rebel against God, and this ordered place becomes disordered. This then is the story of all of us, that we bring disorder to the order that God wants in the world, but that Jesus ended up being the answer, the solution to that disorder. That if we follow after Jesus, he orders our lives, he orders our communities, and he orders our world in such a way that we can bring peace to the chaos. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul in the book of Colossians writes this about Jesus. He says, for, for God in all of his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who once were far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, through Jesus, he has reconciled you, he's brought order to your life, to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. So the view that I'm espousing here is one that John Walton would espouse in the, uh, the book on Adam that I uh, shared with you at the beginning. And it's called the, archety the archetypal view. And it basically says that Adam and Eve, he believes, were real people. Uh, they weren't called Adam and Eve because they would have existed before Hebrew was a language. So we don't know what they called each other. Maybe honey pot or love you, you know, love, lovely or whatever. We don't know what they called each other. But, but uh, they were actual people who at some point were given priestly duties over sacred space as God was trying to make inroads with, with the people that he created. And they fell away. They walked away from God. They brought disorder to the order that God longed for the world and for human beings to have. Their story then is not just their story. 
Their story is our story as well. And so they served what's likely a historical function, but they also served an archetypal function, which is like they are stand-ins for all of us because their story is our story. The beauty of Christianity is that Jesus Christ comes to fix our own disorder and to make our world a more ordered, more peaceful, more God-centered place. That's what the Apostle Paul in Colossians says that he's come to do, and that's what we can invite him into our lives to do for us. As we say around here all the time, following after Jesus will make your life better and make you better at life. He can bring order to your chaos and peace to your conflict. And as we head into the rest of our summer, that's my hope for you, that you find that Jesus can do that in your life and that we find that Jesus can do that in our church, in our communities, our cities, our states, our country, and our world. Let me pray for you, and then I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Heavenly Father, thank you for each and every person within the sound of my voice. God, thank you for all of the volunteers and the staff members and the people that, that help to make Verve City Church uh, a reflection of your goodness and your glory into our community. God, we thank you for our partners, people who work in uh, the different nonprofits and the different churches all around the world that we work with in order to try and bring some of your peace and your order into the world. Uh, we're so grateful for the relationships that we have. I pray that this weekend is a, a, a rest and a break and a refreshment for all of them and that we come back next week excited about the work that you're doing in our lives and excited about the work that you're doing in the world around us. May we be a blessing just as Christ has blessed us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.